We give God the glory for that very passionate uh, talk on compassion. And uh, we want to thank Pastor Kusimile and his wife for coming all the way from Botswana. Our neighbors, thank you for reminding us that we are to be imitators of Yeshua. And Jesus is the one who had a lot of compassion. And sometimes I believe as the church, uh, we've lost a little bit of that compassion. So thank you for that great reminder. I pray as we all leave from here, that we will all leave having been reminded of the compassion that Yeshua had and that we will demonstrate that and demonstrate it by going out, going ye into the world to win souls for Yeshua. So thank you. Uh, my job right now is just to introduce somebody special, our next speaker. And I'm here just to introduce Reverend Dr. Suzette Hatting. For those of you who don't know, that fiery lady who just provoked us to pray here in the morning, that's Dr. Suzette. And um, she is a missionary. She's an evangelist. She's an author as well. She works in Papua, Indonesia. And she works with Voice of the City in Ministries International. Many of us who uh, know her also know that she's a daughter of the soil. She is a daughter of the soil, meaning she comes originally from South Africa, based outside, and we're always privileged and honored to have her come back here and uh, just share with us testimonies of what the Lord has done. I think some of us will also know that she worked for many, many years um, with, Dr., uh, with evangelist Reinhard Bonke, who we know had such a passion in her heart for Africa. Africa shall be saved. So, <laughs> so we want to thank God for all the work and how we used her. Can we just thank God as we welcome Dr. Suzette Hatting, a friend, a sister. We love you, Dr. Suzette. Thank you, my darling. Thank you, so thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes, it is... It is my joy and privilege um, to share with you this morning where we started yesterday. And I ask you to apologize that I'm so casual in my trainers. But you know what happened to me yesterday? I missed that one step. And my leg, I sprained my leg. So this morning I'm talking to it. You will preach in Jesus' name. <laughs> So please excuse me being in trainers and not uh, pretty shoes, but that's not the point, isn't that right? So um, this morning I said to Rina, I said, Rina, I'm preaching as long as I can preach in trainers this morning because I'm talking to my foot and I'm talking to my leg and I say, you obey in the name of Jesus. So all right, this morning I'd like to take you back to where we were yesterday. <clears throat> and we talked about yesterday, I talked about kings and priests. And I talked yesterday especially about priesthood. How many of you can remember the five points that God will do in your life if you give yourself? Who, how many can remember? Come on. Worship. Pardon. Humility. Authority. Praying the word. Brokenness. You're absolutely right. You know, um, when people say that I worked with Reinhard Bonke and I was his intercessor, I think people get the idea that I was this intercessor that was just focusing on him, like some people had a full-time intercessor just praying for that person. It couldn't be more wrong. I was the forerunner. I was the John the Baptist. I was going into the nation. I was the preparer of the way. I was the preparer of Reinhardt's meetings worldwide. If Reinhardt had something on his schedule, we went and prepared it in the spirit realm. Working with the local body of Christ. That's why I so appreciate what this man said here. My brother, I could not, I could not uh, honor and applaud you more. Because without the local body, every evangelist is lost. If it's not working together, hand in hand, with the evangelist, whoever he is, even a man like Reinhard Bonke, wow, they are back. Oh, no, never mind, not back yet. Never mind, that's okay. I don't need, it's uh, fine. So anyhow, so if it was not um, for the local, the, the, like Reinhard always said, it's the boats of the local church that the evangelists bring the harvest into. And if those two doesn't work together, 
I cannot see how we can impact a community. Otherwise, it's only an event. If you want an event, go and have your meeting. Put up your lights, put up your screens, put up your, uh, take your microphone and have a meeting. But if you want impact, you need the church and the evangelist. Because the difference between impact and an event is a great meeting, wonderful, big crowds, but you leave nothing behind that is impacting the roots of the community. And that to me is vital. So I so honor you for what you said this morning, very much so. Well, I was the one that worked with the body. I was the one that get the body of Christ together. That was my job, to get them praying, to get them fasting, to get them prepared. And then I was Reynolds co-evangelist. So I was never, Cara, it feed back a little bit. Can you help there a little bit? And um, so I was never just one of these that just focus on one person in a church, like one intercessor, not at all. I was Reynolds co-evangelist. I was the forerunner and I was the troubleshooter. <laughs> That's why it's automatic for me. Let there be a problem, let's act. Let's move, either in prayer or in worship or whatever is necessary, because the Spirit of the Lord is not limited by instruments or sound or anything like that. So, all right. So, I, yesterday I talked very much about um, the priesthood, and I like to go on today about kingship. And... Um, I like to go, and I like to say, for me, the priesthood is that place, as I told you yesterday, at the altar. I told you that's where you pray, that's where we prepare, that's where we fast. And by the way, that's where you get your sermons, not from a book. Never mind, that was just by the way. And, <laughs> and that's where we prepare God in that kingly anointing. That's where we prepare ourselves. You know, thank God, excuse me, don't be angry with me, Ron, I apologize. Thank God if the screen is off and we get into prayer. Come on, say amen. Hallelujah. I am sorry that the screen is off, but that certainly doesn't disturb the Holy Spirit. Look at the wonderful worship we had. Come on, you can clap for Jesus for that one. So I like to take you now to the kingly anointing. The kingly anointing for me is the outflow of the altar. It is where we take the scepter of authority, where we take that place like a king and we rule and we reign and we show the things of Christ after we've been at that place. To me, the kingly anointing is the action. That's the outflow of what happened in the secret place in Matthew 6.6. 6. And believe me, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, 6, what is happening in secret and your father that sees in secret will reward you in the open. It doesn't work the other way around. And that's what Matthew 6 says. says. And then we come, and I'm just laying the foundation. It says, the harvest is ripe. He quoted it this morning. My brother quoted that scripture. He said, the harvest is ripe, but the labor is few. Isn't that right? Come on, let's finish the scripture. The harvest is ripe, the labor is few. Come on. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the field. Why don't we understand about that? The harvest is ripe. The laborers few, therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest. Simple. No prayer, no harvest. It's that simple. No prayer, no harvest. And many a times when I wanted to look into what is the harvest of a meeting, what harvest did we pull in, people say to me, oh, let's look at the administration and maybe the weather was not good and maybe the, the, maybe the, the traffic was this and that. And we found a thousand reasons why we didn't have the harvest. All of that means nothing. Let's go right back to the altar. That's the place where the harvest is released. That's the place where the harvest is prayed through. That's the place in the secret place what God eventually will show in the open. No prayer, no harvest. Amen. So Reinhard Bonke always says, and that's why I so appreciate you this morning. My, my spiritual daddy, Reinhard Bonke, he said, 
a church that lost their evangelistic program has lost itself. That's what he says. And people, please allow me this morning. So Lord, I pray that this would fall in the hearts of the people. That we would speak what God speaks and say what God say. And Lord, that we could bring that which is really on your heart this morning. Father, I really pray for that in Jesus' name. And I thank you for that. You know what, people? We don't have the pictures on the screen. Let me talk to you as an evangelist. As an evangelist that ran through 72 nations. Let me talk to you as the one behind the scenes in the preparation and on the stage as the evangelist. Let me speak to you this morning and let me speak from my heart to you. Oh, how I wish that we would take evangelism away from an event. How I long that the church would remove evangelism from an outreach, a screen, a mic, lights, and a stage. How I long that we would take evangelism to the place of a lifestyle where we understand that evangelism is not a two-week event somewhere in a, in a country which is not wrong. But if we understand that evangelism has become your mandate from the day you got born again. Yes, we have got the five-fold ministry and the mandate of the office. Reynard surely was in the mandate of the office, but I saw my place. My job is to fulfill the Great Commission. How I long that we would take evangelism from a place of an event and a screen and a summer program in the church and now we have this evangelistic teams that go out because that's how it functions in the church. I believe the entire local church needs to know that evangelism is their mandate. It doesn't matter if we go to another country. Yes, he's right. Not all of us can go through 72 nations. But every one of us can go to one. I cannot maybe reach the millions like Reinhard did in his way, but every one of us can speak to one. And this is what I say. He who lost the passion for one has lost the heart of God. Let me repeat that. He who lost the passion for one has lost the heart of God. Why? Because it's not about the numbers. Jesus Christ himself preached to the 5,000, maybe 20,000 if we take the women and the children that were there. But he's also the same God in his greatest need and his greatest pain that didn't speak to the crowds at the cross but the one next to him. And so I believe that evangelism should be a lifestyle. That's why we see in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5, Paul is preaching Timothy, uh, uh, teaching Timothy. He's teaching him what's important. This is Paul who used Timothy to go and work in the churches, to go where Paul has been, where he raised the churches. And now Paul is talking to his spiritual son. And he says to him, preach the word. Be instant season, out of season. Prove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Second Timothy chapter two verse five. And then that same Paul in a very few two, three verses later says, "But watch thou, watch out in all things, endure afflictions." I can just see Paul sitting there and says, "My son, listen to me." The way I talk to my team. I would say, my son, my daughter, come and listen to me here. Let me talk to you. And I talk to my team like a mother. Yes, I am their mother, but I'm also their trainer. And what do I teach them? I teach them that prayer is a lifestyle and evangelism is a lifestyle. I teach them that prayer has priority. Why? Because out of the inner flow of the prayer room will be the outflow of the ministry. Like today, in our team, you can ask Kara, that's here. Every Wednesday, doesn't matter what invitation we got, doesn't matter who wants to see us, it doesn't matter if the president wants to see us or even the mayor of the city, it doesn't matter who asked for that Wednesday, Wednesdays is non-negotiable in our team. 
Doesn't matter who ask. They already ask in the beginning. They said, Mom, please, we have got this invitation. It's so important. I said, your appointment with the living God in the inner room is more important than any other invitation. So every Wednesday in our ministry in Indonesia and everywhere else is the day of going in there. And the teams, the media teams has their hour. The, the evangelistic team has their hour. The children ministry has their hour. The cooks that cook for the people has their hour. Every department has to lock into that prayer room in their time. Because I, I develop a culture of prayer in my team and then develop a culture of ministry. And so we see here that now Paul is talking to Timothy and he says, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of the ministry. Amazing. I can just imagine Paul talking there. He says, now my son, listen to me. You need to be in and out of season. You need to be ready. The only way you're going to do that is actually spending that time there in prayer and intimacy. Paul taught us all that. And then he said, he said, my son, rebuke, build doctrine, do everything that's necessary. You know, you're going to suffer. You might have long suffering, my son. He, he teaching me that. He says, rebuke, as long suffering, whatever is necessary. But son, don't you ever forget to take the cross. I can imagine that. Why? Because although Jesus bless the church he came for a dying world let's never forget that Jesus never came for full churches although I respect the local church Jesus never came for us to have blessed meetings Jesus never came just for signs wonders and miracles although that's the outflow of it all Jesus came for a dying world and that has to be our focus so I want to move on real fast because I want to come to the real reason of the flow of what I want to come to. You see, my brothers and my sisters, when we understand evangelism, for me, I teach big evangelists, mass evangelists. For us, mass evangelism is, somebody asked me the other day, he said to me, Dr. Suzette, I want to ask you a question. I said, yes. He said, what does it feel like to preach in front of a million people? Which, of course, I have done. I said, the same as preaching in front of one. There is no difference. Same preparation, same Holy Spirit, same back, same altar work, same there, same. There is no difference. Because he who lost the heart for one has lost the heart of God. And so I see here when I spend that time at the altar, people, I don't worry about the anointing. I'm not concerned about the breakthrough. I'm not concerned in our meetings, and unfortunately we cannot show you now here on the screens, and that may be fine, but in our meetings, most of the miracles in my crusades happened while I'm preaching, long before we pray for the sick. There is not one single meeting that I know of that does the miracles doesn't happen because he sent his word and healed them. So in most of our meetings, which we had prepared for you to show you, uh, tumors disappeared and blind eyes open and things start happening and people are automatically healed under the sound of the word because the cross presented all. And so we see here that now we see for us who are, who, when you spend that time at the altar, I'm not concerned so much about the sermon because Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 14 says, my word is a fire in your mouth. So when the word of God is a fire in your mouth, you don't have to work up the anointing. You don't have to work up anything. He is the presence. He is the anointing. And when you understand that, you know, you learn that something that I do think we need to teach in missions. If you ask me, what is one of the most important things we need to teach in missions? Then, you are, and then I will say the culture of honor, the culture of prayer, and the culture of accepting 
affecting the culture where you are. You know, now I'm in Papua, Indonesia, the furthest way in the east. And there's somebody at our gate. And when I look at them, or when my team look at them, they could clearly see that they were tribal people because of what they had on and what they didn't have on. Very tribal. They walked three days through the jungle to find me. They walked three days through the slums to find me and spent almost a week on the back of some cars to find us because they heard about us. And when they came to us through some interpre interpreter, they were talking to us. And they said, we, uh, excuse me, they said 58 years ago, we were still cannibals. We lived in trees. And then some missionary came, a Dutch missionary came, and he told us about Jesus. He says, and then he left us. And we didn't know what else to do. He says, there, there are no roads to Moscona. There's no way to reach them but by helicopter. They, how they walk through those slums is beyond me. And anyhow, and so they came and then we heard about you. They said, and you have to go back with, with, with us. I said, please, I cannot. How can I walk back with you? First of all, I had this operation in the leg. I was two years in a wheelchair. And how shall I walk through the slums with them with this operated leg? I said, I'm sorry, I cannot. They said, if you don't go back with us, they will kill us. We were sent by our tribe to come and find you. I said, God, what do I do? Please, what do I do? I need an answer now. And then one of them said, you know what, mom? When we go into our tribe, we have to first slaughter a pig. I said, you need to do what? They said, we need to slaughter a wild pig. And then we have to put the legs of the pig on our arms. And they say, well, then we walk into the tribe. And if you walk in like that with the pig on our arms, the legs, then they know we had success. And we don't dare walking in there without you coming with us, mom. And the Holy Spirit said, there's your answer. And I called my cameraman. And I said to them, tie me, tie me onto you. Tie me the way you tie your pig. Tie me, tie me the way you, 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 you tie the, that pig onto you. And I said to my camera, take photos. Now I've been called many things. I've never been called a pig. And never mind. And I got there and he took photos and we laminated for them and we sent them back to the tribe. And I said, you go and tell them, the mother, which is me, say, the moment I find an iron bird, I'll come. Because they didn't know what was a helicopter. And so I started searching for a helicopter. They went back and with their bare hands, they start making something that looked like a helipad. And they tried to prepare the way we explained to them for the iron bird that's going to bring the mother. And they were the mocking. Every, all the tribes in that whole area start mocking them and says, you are foolish if you think that that white woman would come. But you know what? We are not just the white women. We are on a mission for Jesus Christ. Nine months later, I found such a helicopter. I said, I don't care if I sell the clothing from my body, but we're going to take that helicopter. It was extremely expensive. And we got there and we flew to Moscona. It was that remote that the government came to ask us afterwards about it because they didn't even know about what is going on in Moscona. And we flew in there and we started evangelizing. And the tribes, the unreached tribes that cannot read nor write, how shall they know about Jesus if they can't read the Bible? Then you start dramatizing the Word of God. You start showing them the love of God. That's when your three-point sermons doesn't work. And we start dramatizing the word of God to them. And we start teaching them about the cross. And we start teaching them about Jesus. And the tribes came from the mountains and they sleep there for one week. And when I was in that little helicopter that had to take me there, I stood there with some of my team, and this helicopter would come back and forth to fetch us, and there was a pig. I said, and this pig? They said, this pig has to go with you. I said, this pig and I in the same helicopter. They said, yes, mom. I said, 
What are we taking the pig with us for? For food, mom. Food. A pig. I don't even like pig meat. They said, yes, mom. So it's my team and I and pig in the helicopter on the way to Moscona. I don't want to talk to you about how we slept there. I don't want to talk to you about how we slept on the floor. Toilets? Don't even talk to me about it. It's not good for your health. And so there we evangelize and we tell them about Jesus and it's bitter cold and it's raining up in the mountains. And after one week I said, I just want to go back. I just, I just, want, to want, I just want one proper shower. And I just want to sleep again on a mattress. My back was so tired of sleeping on the floor. And then we went. And it was actually a German pilot. And we went back and I meet typical Suzette, you know, I'm taking photos and, and I saw this little airplane, this little helicopter was really, really shaking. And eventually he said to me, you better start praying. I said, why? He says, we are in a storm and I can't get out. I've tried the gorge, I've tried that, I've tried that. He says, and please look at the fuel. We don't have enough fuel. You know what people? Then you don't pray, hallelujah, oh, stop it, you pray SOS. God, help, I need a few angels now. And they said, we need to make an emergency landing, but we are in the jungle of Papua. People, it's jungle, it really is jungle. And I said, where shall we land? And we go and we go and we try to find a place to land. And we landed. I saw that there was a little riverbed. And I said to him, land in the riverbed. And he says, no, no, no. Look, there's a little village. So he brought that helicopter around and he landed it masterly. Absolutely amazing. Right there, right there at, at this little village. And people came running from behind the bushes, from everywhere, because they heard the sound of the helicopter. It's jungle. It's quiet. They heard it. So they came running. And when they came running to the helicopter, they, I thought they were going to pull the helicopter apart. I thought they were going to, they, they were going to kill us right there. And I said to the team, people, we need to get out. They're pulling this helicopter apart. And I say, jump, but nobody move. And then I realized, I said, you jump first. So I forced the door open and I jumped out and I ran as fast as I could. I'm tall. Man, please, people, I'm, I'm larger than life. I'm easy to see. That's what I said to my doctor. Doctor, you have to help me. I'm just too fat. You know what he said? You're not fat. You're just easy to see. Right. And I'm charging, and I'm running, and I'm running to a little building, and I stand at the top there, and all the people run with me. They followed me because they saw this clear, I mean, please, people, you can't help it. I'm whiter than milk. You can't miss me. And I stood there on three steps, at the tiny little building was there. And all these people came running from the, from the bush to us, and they were right here in front of me. And I thought, now what? I pulled him away from the helicopter, and the pilot managed to cover the helicopter with a sail to try to protect the helicopter and get out his telephone, satellite telephone, to find out where we were. And my coworker came to me and says, Mom, Mom, I can understand them. They speak a dialect, but they still speak a dialect of Bahasa Indonesia. I can understand what they say. And they say, it's the mother, it's the mother. He says, Mom, you start preaching and I'm translating, let's have a crusade. I said, right, let's go. And I start preaching. And I start preaching the word of Jesus Christ to these people. No microphones. We're not bothered about a screen that doesn't work. Welcome to the mission field. Come on, say amen. Come on, say amen. We're not bothered about microphones. That's why I said to this beautiful lady, wow, are your instruments playing? Yes, go and sing. Don't care about the screen. And so I start preaching, and they cry, and the tribe gives their life to Jesus. And we pray for the sick, and Jesus healed him. Four hours later, the pilot came running. He says, you need to get back into that helicopter. When I say, three, run! So I said to the team in English, I said, if I say three, you charge! So, one, two, three, charge. And we run as fast as we could back to the helicopter. But these people were faster than me. 
<laughs> and they grab my clothes and they would pull it off my body and they beg us. They says, please don't go. Please don't go. Because we prayed six years that God would send somebody. Our storm was the answer of their prayer. And maybe today, if it's ever, ever about missions, it's not about the perfect organization, although, please, I work for one of, the, one of the evangelists with the largest crowds in the world that I know of in evangelism. We work with the screens. We work with the, with the stage. We work with the trucks. We prepare it all. It's not that I'm against mass evangelism, but mass evangelism is a very small part of evangelism. Mass evangelism is a tiny part of evangelism. Evangelism is a lifestyle wherever God has you that moment. You see, people, our storm was the answer of their prayer. People want to know that Christ is alive. Evangelism is showing Christ, not preaching Christ alone. If we cannot balance it between showing the love of God and preaching the love of God, that's why Paul is so strongly, so strongly talking to them. And you know, just to give you an example, for me, evangelism is as natural as breathing. I don't even call it evangelism. I simply call it Christianity. It's not evangelism. It's not some kind of area in the church that is assigned to it. Evangelism is who you are in Christ. I'm in Singapore. I'm doing the conference for Cornerstone Women Conference. And the lady that cleaned my room is from Vietnam. Well, I cannot speak Vietnamese. But every one of us has a telephone. And every one of us has some app on it that can translate. Isn't that right? And so I start putting Vietnamese through my telephone to show her what I was saying. And I start talking about Jesus. And I took money and I put it in her hands. And I said, Christ love you. And she burst out in tears on the ground. She said, who is Christ? Who is Christ? The cleaner lady. When I was in Australia, the lady that cleaned my room, she also talked a language I could not. She talked Portuguese, and I can't speak Portuguese. And so I took the, I thought, what can I give her? And my host and hostess gave me a beautiful bunch of flowers. And so I just pick up the flowers from my table, and I just push it in her hands. That's all I could do. She saw my Bible. The next day, the owner of the hotel called me and he says, did you give flowers to one of our workers? I said, yes, please, I'm so sorry. Did she get into trouble? It's my fault. I, I, I gave it to her freely. He says, no, 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 it's okay. She wants to talk to you through an interpreter. Okay, and I got there and she said, we moved to Melbourne three months ago. She says, we knew nobody. And I thought, God has forgotten me. God has forgotten me. My husband is bedridden. I didn't think God hear my prayers until you push flowers into my hands and I knew it was God. And I call my host, my pastor, the pastor where I was ministering, and we start talking. They turned out, they went back to this house. They prayed for the man. God healed them. Today they are elders in the church. Evangelism is just simply being Christian. It's simply being who you are. Don't preach to me with all respect. Don't preach to me, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. And you preach it from the stage and you don't live it. I need to move on quickly. And I can tell you story after story. Evangelism is being on the mission with the cross. Yes, I myself do mass evangelistic crusades. Yes, absolutely true. We have 30,000, 40,000, 80,000 in my crusades per meeting. No, no, it's not, it's not unusual. Is that evangelism? No, that's the event. Evangelism is when there's no microphone, no lights, nobody around, 
and I show the love of God. That's Suzette. Don't let me show you the evangelism of how God does creative miracles and blind eyes open and legs are being healed and everything is being healed. Where God do creative miracles in our meetings while we preach. Women with colostomy, who at the back she was sewed up. On the front everything was come out. While the preaching happened, God closed up the front and opened the back. Many things like that. Oh, is that the evangelist? Is it how to know that's the evangelist, the Holy Spirit? Who is Suzette? I'll show you, Suzette. You come and see me four o'clock in the morning when it's God and me alone. When it's Him, that's why I said, don't show me your sermons. Don't show me your miracles. Don't show me how many, how many people are in your church. Don't even show me that. That's purely the mandate and the Holy Spirit. Show me your prayer life and I know who you are. And so, for me, it's a lifestyle. That is the real, Suzette. So how did you prepare this crusade, Suzette? What did you do for us? The preparation of the meetings always worked like that. We went, I went two to three weeks beforehand, before Reinhardt, or even our own meetings, or let me go back up even. I sometimes would go three months beforehand, and I would meet with the pastors and the leaders. And the pastor says to me, I sent you my intercessors. I says, no, thank you, send me the church. Send me the whole church. Don't send me your secluded group that you call intercessors. Intercession was never meant for a secluded hallelujah group. Intercession belongs to the church. So he sent me the church. So we start training and we start teaching them and we start teaching them the word of God and we start with a prayer chain to prepare the place in prayer. That church, you have this date. That church, you have that date. That church, you have that date. That church, you have that date. And that's how we start preparing them in prayer to prepare the spiritual area. And then from there, then I would arrive, maybe let's say again, uh, maybe two weeks beforehand, and we would start with early prayer meetings, five o'clock in the morning. And I say to the pastors, don't you send me your intercessors, send me the whole committee. That's the deal. I expect everybody in the committee to be on that prayer meeting because I'm also there. Even if I am the preacher myself, even if it's my own crusade, I am in there five o'clock in the morning because this is not about the great star. This is about the kingdom of God. So we are in there and we start praying every morning, five o'clock, and we start praying at the crusade's grounds, if it's at all possible. And we start interceding. We start walking around the crusade ground. We start praying. We have early morning prayer, one hour, because people need to go to work. Sharp, one hour, from five to six, we are praying. We are, I expect the whole committee in there. I expect the pastors in there. Don't you dare saying you are the pastor and you don't show them how to do it. And then we start, after we've done that every morning, then I would start doing at night what we call the weekend before the actual event, or maybe the few days just before the actual event, we start with what we call prayer concerts, where we do worship and prayer. Those of you people that were at the trumpet call, you will know what I'm talking about. By the way, your photos is on the groups already. And so here we start with worship and prayer and worship and prayer. And we would take the city into worship and prayer long before the evangelists start going into action. We prepare and in those prayer places of worship and prayer like a prayer concert. We pray and we worship and we pray and we worship. Most of the time, miracles start happening so fast that by the time the actual crusade happened, we don't have a built up, built up, built up to the crusade. No, no, no. The prayer starts here and we continue built up, built up, built up straight from the prayer beforehand to the morning prayer, to the prayer concert, to the actual event. It is a smooth going over. That's how we prepare our crusades. The emphasis on prayer has equal importance as the actual event. And that's how we prepare it. 
And that's how we jumped from 20,000 in Reynolds meetings to 50,000 to 100,000. Excuse me. Apologize. To 150,000 to 300,000 to 500,000 to 1.2 million per meeting. That's the pattern we used. What was the key? We involve the church to pray a place through. I was only the instigator. You see what I'm like? I'm only the motivator. Come on, let's get moving. <laughs> but, the, but the secret, if we look at what opened the prison doors for Peter, it was when the church prayed in Acts chapter 12. Because when the church go into prayer and into action, prison doors open and angelic beings start moving. That's what the Bible teaches. So instead of having a prayer group that followed me, uh, they asked me always, how many people were in your prayer department? I said, two. I said, pardon. I said, well, later we were three and we thought it's a crowd. Three? Yes, three of us. And what did you do, Suzette? We landed the place like Lagos, or we landed the place like Pretoria, or we landed the place like Johannesburg, and those three were trained by me. And I said, you go, we take a city, and we divide the city into blocks, and we take block one, block two, block three, block four, block five, block six, and I say, you take one, you take that block, you take that block, I take this block. And we organize the same teaching, the same way in each block, and then, at the end, we pulled them together in the prayer concerts. You understand what I'm saying? We took the place. We divided it in blocks. We start training, 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 training. Two weeks, they, I'm there and then there. Two nights per place, two nights per place, three nights per place. We prepare the next block, the next block, the next block. And then right before the event, we pulled all the blocks together in a central place in the, in, into, this, into this prayer concert where we pray and worship and pray and worship and we pray the word and we start releasing the miracles and God start healing the people. So by the time Reinhard or even I start my crusade, the city is not cold. They are already flowing in faith. And then we start preparing the place. What is the follow-up? The follow-up is the normal follow-up in the churches with pastors where all these souls that get saved go into the different pastors. And on the prayer department, please listen to me. On the prayer department... That's also a follow-up. And this is where the church fail. We follow up the souls, but we never follow up the breakthrough that happened in the prayer. So I started all over the world prayer towers where they come together after the crusades every Saturday morning from 4.30 to 6 to pray for the city. And that way, we maintain what we have broken open in prayer. We maintain because we are not after an event. We are after impact. In, in Manukwari, excuse me, when I started... The, when I did the crusade there, the prayer department of the church told me beforehand when I landed there, they said, we prayed already. I said, oh, really? Yeah, we prayed three nights. I said, <laughs> my crusades were different. And we start training them into prayer. And we start leading up. And we start praying around the grounds. And we start interceding. And when we start doing with the prayer concerts, worship and prayer, somehow the miracles start happening. And the word of knowledge started flowing. And one of the top men of the city, well, there was a word of knowledge that I had. And I said, you, 
This is what your bedroom looks look like. This is where you hide your pornography. This is what it looked like. In the corner of your bed. This, 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 this. That's what it looked like. And I described the building. And the guy ran forward and he says, God saw me. God saw me. I'm a sinner. And the fear of God fell upon the place. And God moved. That in the night until three o'clock, we heard the people return home singing worship and God filled the city with worship and prayer. And we started the prayer towers since 2016 until this day. The prayer tower is every Saturday, 4.30 till 6, every Saturday and I've long given it over to the local leadership, my spiritual sons that are doing a brilliant job with it. I actually think that you were there. Were you not at the prayer tower? Where is, um, were you not at the prayer tower on this, uh, in Manakwari? You didn't get to go, okay? Every Saturday. And they keep the flow of God over the city. Why? It started in the follow-up of the prayer and into the follow-up of the souls. I want to go on quickly, and I, I see I'm a little bit over my time, and I want to go on quickly to evangelism. Evangelism is an event. You can have your event, your screens, your lights, your microphones. That's a very small part. I would say 80% of true evangelism is not some department in your church. People, help me, Lord. Help me, Jesus. I feel very strong about this. And if I'm too passionate about it, I ask your forgiveness if this is strong for you. But I want to tell you today, is it not your place as a the denominational leader? Is it not your place, you who lead this, if it is the AFM or if it is whatever denomination you lead or wherever you are, whichever pastor you are, it is your job to teach your people evangelism and prayer as a culture and a lifestyle. And if you don't, like Reinhardt said, the church that lost his evangelistic program has lost itself. And I want to go on just quickly in a closing. You have got the mass evangelism you have got it as a lifestyle on a one-to-one -one basis wherever you are. And I want to go into this if you give me one more minute. I want to say some of the greatest crusades I've ever held in my life was on death row in America. One person. One person. Five people. Why? Because my Christ in his greatest pain, did not care about the number. He cared about the one next to him on the cross. I take you to, with me to a place called Homan. Homan is where the executions take place in America. Right there, Homan is the place in Alabama where the men are waiting for the execution dates. I asked to go in there. The guy who organized it for me said, absolute no, it's a no, madam. Well, you know I'm not going to accept no for Jesus that easy. If it's no because I have to submit to the leadership, no problem to be no. But if it comes to the cross, the Bible says he came to seek and to save the lost. So I said to him, Steve, I make a deal with you. You ask and I pray and we see what happens. He said, madam, I said, you just ask. Until they said no, they said yes. He asked we got permission into Homan. When I got there, the main wardener said to me, Madam, I don't know if, he says, do you know what you do? What, what must I say? I don't know what I do. Of course not. I've never been in a, in a high security prison like this. I, I, I don't, do you know what you do? Of course not, I don't know what I do. I only know one thing. There are lost people in there and that's all I know. He said, Madam, this man has killed many people before. And we will have a bloodbath. 
He says, if these beast people kill you, we cannot help you. He says, and it will be the one that they've killed many times before. I said, they won't. He looked at me like, you foreigner, what do you know? I said, they won't. He says, okay, it's totally your own responsibility. I said, it's fine. And when I walk away, I said, God, all the angels of angel, Michael, I need him here now. So we went. The first night, they brought in about 11 of these men. They took off their chains. They sat around. They, they, they were there. They were high security. They were people that are waiting for the execution date. They are murderers. They are gangsters. They are everything. I preached the gospel, and it was fine. I said, ah, it's all overrated. Next day, I had two days. When I walk in there, they brought five men. The one guy was so tall, he looked like a double-decker bus. He walked in there, he sat with his sunglasses, and he starts staring at me like this. And he totally and utterly intimidated me. I was completely intimidated by this guy. He was staring at me. He was intimidating me. I stood there. I didn't know what to do. They brought in these five guys. They took off their chains. They looked at one another, and then they went out, and they locked the door, and they left us inside there alone. Me, my co-worker, Stephen Claxton, and the organizer, Steve. And I thought, oh, God, now what? And this guy stared at me like this. And he stare, and he stare, and it felt to me like all hell is looking at me. And I'm totally intimidated, completely intimidated. And I didn't know what to do. And suddenly, these guys that were there, they didn't even look at me. They just watch this guy. They watch him. They didn't listen. They just watch him. Because they knew he will move. They knew he will be violent. They knew he will try to kill me. Because that's what he's known for. So they didn't even listen. Suddenly I stood there and I thought, hang on. This guy, if you, if, if you challenge Suzette, I'm just a woman. I might be a poor woman, but I'm just a woman. I stand no chance. And then suddenly I thought, this guy, he challenged the Jesus in me. Well, now that's a different story. You challenge the Jesus in me, you deal with the Lion of Judah. And suddenly, the power of God inside of us people, that which the Holy Spirit gives us, that which God says, I have anointed you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, suddenly stir inside of me. And I did something. Please don't get scared. Please don't get scared of me, please. But I took my Bible like that, and I went, bam! <laughs> On the pulpit. And everybody jump. And they look at me. And suddenly, I walk over to this guy. And I said, what's your name? He says, my name is Greg. I said, Greg, but he's taller than me. I look up to him. I said, Greg, if you think you intimidate me, you are my dear one. And suddenly, word of knowledge starts flowing out of my spirit. And I said, look at you, man. I said, you were a young guy that went to church. You were a one gu young guy that went with your grandma. You were a young guy that believed in Jesus one day. And then you got into the wrong crowd. And I start laying out his life by word of knowledge. And I start pouring out. And I says, this is how you got into drugs. And that's when you got your first gun. And this is what happened to you. And this is where you got into pornography. And this is where you're going to. I says, and 35 days from now is your execution date. He says, how do you know that? And all the other there stopped breathing. They thought he was going to kill me. And suddenly, he took off his glasses. And he said, madam, you are right. Will Jesus still accept me? And tears rolled over his cheeks. And he knelt down. And he gave his life to Jesus. Now don't clap, don't clap. And when he knelt down, the other five, the most notorious murderers in that prison, stood up and said, if he wants Jesus, we want Jesus. And they knelt down.
and they gave their lives to Jesus. Now you clap for the Holy Spirit. And I stood there, and I didn't know what to do anymore. I thought, now what? Now they gave their lives to Jesus. They cry, I cry, but we are not allowed to touch them. Of course, in the prison, you're not allowed to touch them. And I thought, Jesus, now what do I do? What do I do? Please help me. And I remembered Paul and Silas that was worshiping God. I said, let's praise the Lord. Let's start singing songs. But the songs I know is not the songs they know. We don't know the same uh, songs. And suddenly I remember, oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. And prisoners start singing. And I knew that prison got filled with the praises of God. Why? Because evangelism is not a stage and a mic and lights and a microphone. 30 days later, he was executed. Before that, he managed to send me a note which they censored, of course, from the prison, but still, he says, Madam, I will never forget you. See you in heaven, Greg. Evangelism is a lifestyle. And people, allow me to say this. The Bible says, your word is a fire in my mouth. God says in Hebrews 22, verse 25, our God is a consuming fire. And if we go and we look in the Word, and I'll cut it short because I'm over my time, you see that a new wave of revival is a new wave of fire. And a new wave of fire is a new wave of revival. You cannot separate revival and the move of God. You cannot separate. If you want not an event, but you want impact, you cannot get away from the fire. And we see that God, when God wanted to make a covenant with Abram, he came by fire. Genesis chapter 15. And when God wanted to call Moses back to his calling that he ran from, in Exodus 3, verse 2, we see he came by fire. And when God wanted to talk to them and reveal who he was, in, in 1 Kings chapter 18, and he poured out his fire, he poured out that on the altar, he came by fire. And you can go right through the Bible. I couldn't have the time here. I've got lists and lists and lists that I can give you. But you see, right through the Bible, God came by fire. God came by fire. God came by fire. We see in Acts chapter 2 verse 3, when the Holy Spirit came with His power and authority, He came by. By fire. And Jesus Himself said, He will baptize you with fire. And people, that way we can go on. Hebrews 1 verse 7 says that he make his servants flames off. So let me talk to you. Let me ask you, what does your fire look like? I am 46 years in full-time work now. You know what? Just here in South Africa, Traveling through South Africa this month, we unpack my suit our suitcases 19 times. Pack and unpack. Is that the hardest? No. Is the hardest to go from place to place? No. Is the hardest to face the different cultures? No. Is the hardest to eat the different food that you are not used to? No. It's the hardest, the culture, because their culture is different than yours. It's not the same? No. I'm also going to write a book one day, uh, Ron. I'm going to call it The Mission's Bed. The guest bed for the missionaries, which is up the mountain and down the valley on the mattress. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm saying? You lie on the bed and you wonder which side you're going to roll to. Is that the hardest? No. You know what is for me? The hardest in the ministry is not even my three o'clock praying if I preach at ten. It's not even the hours of intercession or fasting, no. 
the hardest thing in the ministry, in including evangelism or anything in missions you want to call it, it's to keep your spirit sharp. That's the hardest. To keep the freshness of your spirit, my sister. I don't care how many prayer meetings you are in. The hardest thing is to keep that freshness in your spirit, that sharpness in the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about your sermons. God will bless your sermons because God will bless the Word. I'm talking of you. Now, I'm closing with this testimony. Yes, I let the prayer for Reinhardt. I prayed an average of six to eight hours every day. Every day. That is my preparation for my meetings plus my leading the team because I was the pastor of the team as well. And the prayer for the intercession for Reinhardt's crusade and everything together sometimes come to six to eight hours every day of my life. I spend 99% of my life in the prayer room. That's why this one guy that was up here, he says, we worked for Reinhard Bonke, we never saw you. You're right, I'm in the prayer room while you are working, making sure the angels take care of you. And then, and then, I found, although I pray so much, and I pray so many hours, I found the freshness of my spirit changed. I got into a system. I got into a religion. I'm on missions. When Reinhardt can't go and do a crusade, he sent me. I'm the forerunner. I make sure that things happen. I make sure that the body of Christ pray. Where I lead them into fasting and prayer. I do that for hours, for days, for weeks, for months, for years. I'm the pastor of the team. My bedroom in the mission field was the kitchen, it was the hospital, it was the counseling room, it was everything. But then I found that somehow my own prayer life, although I pray hours, I lost that, that sweetness, that cutting edge, that fine discernment, that fellowship with Jesus. My life became a prayer life, became a system. It became a pattern. It became a form. It lost the place where it had the room for the Holy Spirit, where God could do what He wants to do when He wants to do, to break my heart with what break His heart. And then we were at a conference. And there was a guy called with the name George Smith from South Africa. And he preached. He actually didn't even preach. He just got up and he said, God says, I have it against you that you lost your first love and an arrow pierced my spirit. Surely, God, you can't talk about me. I gave everything for you. I gave up the man I was going to marry for the missions. I gave up my life. I gave up my family. I gave up everything. Surely it's not me. I pray eight hours every day. I have it against you that you lost your first love. God, no. You mean me. And then I understood. Because you see, beloveds, that scripture in Revelation chapter 2, I have it against you that you lost your first love, does not mean that they were backslidden. It does not mean that they didn't love God. It that they were good Christians. Go and read it. But I know the Greek. It means this. I have it against you that you lost focus. You see, my darling, we can run for the ministry and we can run and we can do and we can preach. But if Jesus is not the utter focus of your prayer room, you shift focus. This morning, 
I am the one that says, come on, let's pray. That man of God says, let's worship. We actually got focus on a screen. It's true. Maybe your organization is your, is your point. Maybe, my brother, you got so wrapped up in the place of having to want to get the conference right and everything right. I challenge you today. I ask you today, how much of Jesus is truly your focus? Your prayer life. The building fund. All good. All from God. How much is your focus? Him. When that young man said it, everybody knew me in that conference. Everybody. I was on the top. I ran to the front. I fell on my face before God. I said, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Because my prayer life is a pattern. It's a prayer meeting. It's a system. It's preparing the crusades. I am not in there loving Jesus anymore just because he's Jesus. Just because he saved my soul from eternal hell. I fell on my face. How do you know you start losing your fire when you don't enjoy to pray as much as you did before? When you don't read the Bible as much as you did before? When you don't enjoy following, fellowshipping with God's people as much as you did before. So don't talk to me about missions. If you don't deal with your altar first. Before you go to the porch. And I fell on my face that day. And I said, God, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. That was 43 years ago. And I never lost that fire again. Because I make sure that my balance between the altar and the porch is equal. To the level this I, what I pray is the level I reach out. Let's pray. I know I'm over my time, but can I ask the worship team to come and help me just with one song, please? And if I'm you, I'm going to take five minutes. I would run to the front like I did that day. If you lost that passion and you lost that fire and you say, I love Jesus, but I don't have that fire anymore, come. Just come. Run! It's you and God. Kurabashaka. That's right. It's your altar before God. You hit the carpet. Kurabashaka Rabasaya. Make it your altar. It's you and Jesus. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me that my prayer life became a system. Forgive me, oh Lord, forgive me. Help me. That's right, people. You've come for an encounter with God. There's only one way to have an encounter. Build your own altar. Your altar before God. You restore that fire. Kur
Start praying, start praying. Our speakers, will you please help me to pray for them? My brother, go. Oh, come on, lift your voice and cry. Here I am. Help me, oh God. Pray, pray, pray. Build your altar, build your altar, build your altar. I've lost my sharpness, Lord. I've lost my cutting edge. Oh, I love Jesus. I serve Jesus. I go, I serve Jesus. I serve Jesus. I serve you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Restore my fire today, O oh God. Marlene and people pray. My sister there, my brother. Pray, pray, pray for people. Please, a bit. Here we are. Here we are, oh God. Restore my altar. Restore my altar. Come, Holy Spirit, come with your fire. Come, Holy Spirit, come, Holy Spirit, come. Is first in my soul. Come, Spirit of God. Come, Spirit of God. Come, Spirit of God. Pray for people, Kara. Pastors, ministers among us, start ministering to the people. We are in the body of Christ. The fire, the fire of God. Bring the fire of Jesus. Sakaya, Riba Sangaraba Sunday, pray, 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 open your mouth and pray, 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 pray. Kuraba Sakaraba Shaka, Kura Sakaraba Sunday, Lord Jesus, Jesus, Kuraba Shakaraba. The rest of you stand on your feet and pray and worship with Him. Go worship Him, I need you, please. Build your altar, build your altar, build your altar before God. Build your altar, build your altar before the Lord. Good, I pray for them, Lord. I pray for them, Jesus. Oh, sorry, my darling, I'm sorry. Fire! 
your feet, everybody. Right where you are, we are way over our time. I ask you to raise your hands and worship God. To glorify the name of the Lord. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down, oh God. Please, my darling, where is that beautiful girl? Here I am to worship. Can we have that? Jesus. Here I am to worship. Here I am. in the churches where's your prayer room show me the prayer room of the church yes. why my sermon only cut like the seagull you hit the carpet and the prayer room and you take ownership of the sermon when I got born again those old Pentecostals they got it right I tell you we still had altar time we still had copper time. Show me, show me the place where I can send you for those that doesn't are not hungry, for those that doesn't want to eat and say, I need somewhere to go and get through to God. I'm not through. I need to pray. I need to seek God. I need to take ownership of the sermon. That's why. Go back to your churches and make prayer the priority and find the prayer room. Where people, after a meeting like this, that doesn't want their broiki or doesn't want their drink or want to go and encounter God, can find the place where they can take ownership. Yes. Close with here I am to worship. three years ago I was at a place like this I hit the carpet and I said Lord it will not happen again help me please you said in Romans chapter 8 you will help my weakness so help me please 43 years later having prayed millions in the world in prayer and evangelism to this day I, I watch I guard my prayer time because I know how easy it is if you are a founder like I am a voice in the city I'm a founder of, of uh, the La Papa Center I'm the founder of six Jaya sons in the world non-profit organizations I know it how easy it is and I do that all on the road three o'clock in the morning I know how easy it is to get wrapped up in the administration instead of touching 
the altar first. Be close with your hand to worship, Lord. I give myself to you today. In Jesus' name, for the last time, darling. Here I am to worship. Raise your hands. Here I am Make it your prayer to, to God. say good and faithful servant oh I don't care I only want to know that I'm a worshiper because God that you found me as a worshiper at the altar because then the porch will flow and I thank you for that in Jesus name Amen and Amen Take your seats. Jesus. 